Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Dr. Joe Vitale, and you have landed on Zero Limits Living. So let me ask you a question. What is Zero Limits all about? How do you live at Zero Limits? What I'm referring to are your beliefs, and your beliefs are causing you to see the opportunities or the lack of opportunities that are out there in the world. Believe me, I know this because when I was homeless, I didn't see any opportunities. Today, because I've changed a whole lot of beliefs, I look out there and there's opportunities everywhere. In fact, it's a little bit overwhelming because there's so many opportunities and such abundance. But you may not be seeing that right now, and that's what I want to help you with. Because every Friday, I bring you inspiration and information to help you live a zero limits life. Now, I usually don't do this alone. And today I'm beside myself because the guest expert that I have has been my secret ally, my secret friend, my coach, my mentor, my confidant, my therapist, my counselor, my guardian angel, and more since around 1985. And I know many of you weren't even born yet. So she has been in my corner since 1985, and she has agreed to be here today. She has written two books, Emotional Options and Traveling Free, both of which I endorse, both of which I helped with, and both of which have been around long enough that, as she says, they're now old enough to vote. So who I have here today is Mandy Evans. And Mandy Evans is a breakout coach, but more than that, she's the original miracles coach. So this is a woman that has shed light for me when I was in the darkness and shed light in the dark corners of my world and helped me go from, I mentioned homelessness and poverty, she helped me go through a lot of life changes by helping me with my beliefs. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Mandy, thank you for joining us. Oh, you are so welcome. I'm excited to be on your new show um, <laughs> and for everybody who's going to watch it. You yes. Shared so much inspiration and generosity of spirit all your life. So I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you. I am forever grateful for all you do and what you're doing right now for everybody that's going to end up watching this. And so I think we want to start with the idea of what is a belief? Because there may be people watching right now and they're hearing me talk about this and there's been references to your books. And there's this concept that, okay, the show's called Zero Limits Living. And I just mentioned Zero Limits has to do with beliefs. Well, let's start there. What is a belief? That's a wonderful question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a word that has so many different meanings. You know, a lot of times it's what you try to think is real like you try to believe something and that doesn't work very well. But the real definition I think that we live by is um, it's kind of your own personal version of reality. What mm. seems true to you? And most of them are hidden. We, we're not aware of them. I mean, I'm not aware that I'm sitting on a, on a chair because I believe it's a chair, um, but I do and I am. And the thing about it is we live by them whether aware of it or not, they dictate everything we do, everything we dream of, everything we dare to dream of. Mm. And they rule out a whole lot of things that we don't dare to dream of, that we don't dare to listen to our own heart's desire about. I read a long time ago that because there's seven, eight, I don't know how many billions of people are on the planet right now, that in actuality, there are seven or eight billion versions of reality because every single person has that belief system, their own personal view of reality. Would you agree with that? I certainly would. Yes, How do we get along then? <laughs> if you've got one belief system and I got another one and everybody else around me, we're all trying to get along, but we're actually looking at life differently. I know that's probably the, the real miracle that we all experience every day. I notice it in traffic. You know, I live outside of, I live outside, just outside Palm Springs near LA. And on that freeway, a lot of people get upset with, you know, how, how the traffic is going and how people cut you off and don't let you merge or move in another lane. And I just am awestruck. And all those cars going at 70, 80, 90 miles an hour and not smashing into each other. Right. Because they all believe enough in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, 
let's take it to the commonplace. What are some common beliefs people have that they may not even be thinking of right now, but when you point them out, they might go, oh, aha, uh -huh, I do have that belief. Are there some <laughs> top common beliefs? That happens to me every time I do a dialogue with somebody kind of exploring their beliefs and they, they always wind up saying, I believe what? Um, <laughs> you know, they're really, really common ones like beliefs about what you deserve and what you don't deserve, mm -hmm. which, you know, is just the biggest advertising hype I think that's ever been, you know, McDonald's started off with you deserve a break today and boy, did it catch fire. You hear it in every ad mm -hmm. and yet people all over the world believe that they don't deserve things that they want. And they, there's nothing really more painful than trying to, trying to crush that out of your own beating heart mm. because you believe you don't deserve it. And then there's some strange ones that, that lots of people believe, but we don't think of. A very common one is no matter what I'm doing, I should be doing something else. Um, you know, I'm doing my taxes, I should be mowing the lawn, I'm mowing the mm. lawn, I should be, um, you know, meditating, I'm meditating, oh, I should have been doing this, it just is endless, and I catch myself doing that, and it robs the joy out of what you're doing. Mm. Where, do, where does a belief like that come from? Because I, I can relate to it. To, there's times when I've done the very same thing. I'm doing one thing and thinking I should be doing the other thing. And if I did the other thing, I'd be thinking I should be doing the thing I am doing. And <laughs> yeah. it's circular and destructive. Where, where does the belief, where do any of the beliefs come from, let alone that one? They're, they're just assumptions we make as we go through life. It, mm. You just you look at things and you think, oh, this is the way it is. And you look at something else and you think that's the way it is. And I think one of the hard things about discovering beliefs is the, the belief that there's some common cause or some important event that happened. But it might have just been, you know, you were tying your shoe on the playground and somebody knocked you over and you start thinking, well, you shouldn't tie your shoes on the playground. Or, I mean, they're absurd in some ways, and yet we live by them. Mm. So it's important to find out the ones that limit you. I mean, you'd go crazy if you just try to figure all of them out. But um, <clears throat> I find it really productive to focus on the ones that either keep you from reaching for something you really want. Mm. To, they keep you from believing it's possible, but it is possible. Well, you know, let's. Let's be specific on something since I've got so many of my books behind me on money that I've written. And that's a topic you and I have talked about as well. And I know that's a subject that's on everybody's mind. Plus I introduced you and made the comment that we live in an abundant world, but we may not see it because of these beliefs. So we can look at abundance, prosperity, or money directly. And where do those limiting beliefs come from or what might be an example or two? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because just before the show, I was thinking about well, what, what are some important ones? And I looked on my website and lo and behold, there were 50 limiting beliefs about money that came from a workshop. I was, I was doing a training for coaches and as part of their training, they did a workshop. And they, we wrote down all the beliefs that came up out of the workshop. And then I've kind of kept track over time. So I printed it out. And here are, there were 50 of them that came up. And I won't read them all. But yeah, give us the top ones. Of course, there's money is the root of all evil, which you've talked about on your show. A and lot, the actual yeah. quote is the love of money which probably really should be translated the worship of money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't deserve a lot of money. Uh, here's one that, that comes with, with people who are reluctant to be affluent. If I have a little more than I need to get by, somebody else has to go without. Mm. As if there's a finite supply. I think that belief shows up in all kinds of shapes and forms, that there's a belief that there's a, finite pie of money and every slice one person gets somebody else doesn't get and it's infinite i mean money's just we made it up and we traded and i mean isn't it amazing that you can trade plastic for a car or a piece of paper <laughs> for dinner out it's astounding um, well, but just stop there for a second if you don't mind mandy how 
even we can pick any one of those beliefs and including that one right there how do you take care of it how do you question it to erase it to delete it to get it so it's no longer limiting you um well the way that you don't do it i'll start with because i'd like to bust that belief bubble Good. is to try to believe something else ah. people so often try they'll take a belief i like i really like the next one which was if i'm successful people will hate me mm. and let, so let's look at that way um first of all i ask do you believe that the answer is usually yeah because you just said it in some mm -hmm. form and then why do you believe it what seems true about it um well we'll look at the one that you that we had before that too if, if i uh get more somebody else has to go without um, so it's kind of hard to do if there's not somebody here who has the belief, but when people really look at it, almost every belief that I've ever worked with just dissolves and becomes absurd. I mean, why, uh. would, that be, why would that be true? If you get more, I have to do without. Uh, what seems true, I'm asking myself, what seems true about that? And I'm really thinking, I can't think of anything. But if somebody did say it, say there's a viewer here, because I can role play that a little bit and say, yeah, you know, if I get a whole lot of money or a whole lot of success, that actually means somebody's got to go without. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't feel comfortable knowing I got more because somebody went without. Why would someone else have to go without if you prosper and have a lot of money? Because I would believe that we're in a limited universe and that there's only so much. There's some sort of finite number that I, in my limited wisdom, don't know what that, that number is. But I'm assuming there's some sort of finite number on the capital that's out there. So if I take a big piece of pie, somebody gets either a little piece of pie or goes without the pie. What seems real about there being a finite number of how much money there is? See, and I love this because I've, I've worked with you enough, and this is what I'm trying to demonstrate to viewers, to know that you get to a certain point where you kind of shrug and you get to a point where you go, well, I, I don't know. I, it just seems like that. Exactly. But there at that point, another, there's... There's another question. What are you concerned would happen if you didn't believe that? What are you concerned would happen if that belief just went away? Would that be Okay. Well, my answer would be, yeah, that'd be totally fine. Uh, again, trying to role play somebody who isn't here. They may say I, I could become incredibly selfish or ruthless or uncaring uh, if I didn't care about somebody getting a piece of the pie and I was getting bigger and bigger pieces of the pie, I might just become a, you know, some version of an ass. Yeah, I've heard that answer. I would, be, I would just become selfish and arrogant and uncaring. And I have a question that I, that I always like to watch the reaction and go, well, what would be wrong with that? <laughs> and that people, not that I think it's okay, but people right. go, that would be horrible. Yeah. And then I, then I just look and I say, well, if you think that would be horrible, why do you believe you would do that? Oh, I got, see, I got chills on that. And I've been there many times with you over the decades that we've worked together where you, you get to the point much like right there. And I'm going to try to re-describe it for viewers where uh, you get to the point where I'm addressing the belief and it looks like I'm at the point where it sounds so reasonable to me that if I become selfish, I'm just going to be an ass and I don't want to be that. And then you come up with the question that says, well, if you don't want to be that, what makes you think you would be that? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it jams the mental system. It jams the belief process. To me, that's when the awakening occurs. That's when you go, oh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. That's what's so much fun about it and what's so hard about it. Because yeah. as we said, a belief is your version of reality. So when we go through a process like that, your version of reality is breaking up. And that's not always comfortable. Very, very often people can't hear the question when that's happening. Yes. yes. You know, they'll, they'll say it over and it'll, it'll often be something they said. You know, like I'll say, why do you believe you would become a selfish ass? 
And if the belief's crumbling away, they go, what? And I'll, I'll, sometimes I have to say it three or four times or even try different ways. So then sometimes we'll have to just stop and breathe. Um, and I don't know what's going on in there. I know, you know, synapses are snapping. Right. But whatever Some, synapses do. Something's um, being remapped. And I've been there enough to, add, to, to remember times when I said, can you say that again? Can you repeat that question? Because I, I fogged out. In, in yeah. that moment. Well, this raises the question, can we do this kind of belief work alone? It's hard. You know, um, both of my books are workshops in a book. They both came from actual workshops, actual questions, actual people going through real things. But, you know, I wrote both of them really for somebody to do with somebody else, with a partner or in a group. And hardly anybody ever does. Right. But it would make it so much easier. Mm. You know, I would love to see coaches who want to work with people at their belief systems to use, for instance, emotional options in a group, because it really adds so much to it. With that being said, you can make a lot of progress doing it by yourself. I've gotten, you know, wonderful letters and thank yous and, and emails and, and reviews of the book saying it's astounding that just asking yourself these simple questions can reveal so much. Um, so but, how could you advise somebody watching right now? We have, you know, we don't know who's watching, but let's say there's somebody really intrigued and somebody at the same time really frustrated. And they're thinking, I, I want to live this zero limits life. I want to really get into abundance and prosperity. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of being small. I'm tired of whatever the frustration is. How, what, what are the basics that they can do on their own short of, you know, going to MandyEvans.com and buying your books and hiring you? Well, why does it have to be short of buying my books? <laughs> <laughs> I can see it being short of hiring me. Very but good. But they're really inexpensive. Very, very good. Um, very good. So um, I, you know, I really don't have an answer, except everybody can start on your own. Mm -hmm. If you're going to question anything in life, question your limits. Mm. And the best limits to question are... Any belief that causes, well, I'm, I was going to say causes unhappiness, but I'll rephrase that and say any belief you don't like having. You know, when my mother died, I was <clears throat> grieving, and I can't honestly say I ever wanted to feel any other way. It was often embarrassing, uncomfortable. I, I was doing workshops on how to be happy, and I was on the verge of tears. But I can't honestly say I wanted to feel something different. But had that continued, had, had I been grieving for years, I definitely would have wanted it to stop. Mm. So anytime you're feeling something like, like anger that's, that's destroying your relationships or guilt that's keeping you from enjoying life, uh, anytime you're feeling something you don't like feeling, question it. And the questions, I mean, I can tell you now, Please. are really simple. Um, if you're feeling some way you don't like feeling, most likely you believe you have to feel that way in order to be a good person. Um, well, for example, there's great fear of happiness, the, the belief that if I were happy, I wouldn't do anything. So if you, if you find a belief, ask yourself, why do I believe it? What seems true about it? And then the real question that frequently brings the truth up is what am I concerned would happen if the belief went away? What am I afraid would happen if I didn't believe that? Like the example we looked at, what am I afraid would happen if I didn't believe that, if, that it's not good for me to make a lot of money because it takes it from someone else? What am I afraid would happen if that belief went away? Well, you had an answer in, in our make-believe mm -hmm. exploration was, well, I would become a selfish jerk. I'd be an ass. Uh, and then we look at that one. Why would that be true? But then I, I, I really have enjoyed becoming a belief detective. And like any other tool, it doesn't work if you don't use it. And the hammer doesn't do anything. It was just sitting there. 
So these questions really you begin to build some muscles when you just get the habit of always, always question unhappiness, question anger, question guilt, question fear. Don't just accept them as inevitable. And don't, well, here's a belief that it causes it. Mm. There's no it. It's built into everything we read. And even a lot of therapists, excuse me, I, I apologize to you, but a lot of therapists say, how does it make you feel? How does that make you feel? Nothing makes you feel anyway, except for physical things like pain. Um, but, you know, guilt, for example, awareness of wrongdoing takes about, what, a second and a half when you realize oh, I don't think that I did that. I don't ever want to do that again. You don't have to repeat it 4,000 times a day for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, so just questioning when I feel guilty, why do I feel guilty? And if I've asked people, for example, what are you afraid would happen if you didn't feel guilty? Well, they'll say, well, then I would be a horrible person. And Why? Why would you be a horrible person if you knew you did wrong and you knew you didn't want to do that anymore? Why would you be a horrible person if you stopped feeling guilty about it? So those are some examples. Always question unhappy feelings, feelings you don't like having. And then always question when you want something and don't believe you can have it when it seems doable, when it seems like other people can have it, but you can't. So when they do this process, do is it better to do it spoken, silently, in writing, with an audio recorder? Is, are there some tips that make it uh, work more efficiently? I found a lot of people and I find it really helpful to do it in writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in both of my books, they're written exercises, and it really helps to write it down. But then it's also wonderful to do it with a friend and have them ask you the question, and hear your answer and then get their feedback and see how they're feeling about it. And I imagine people who are more um, used to talking and more comfortable talking could just do it in a recorder or just by themselves. They could just out loud say, you know, I feel guilty. Well, here's one. The only thing I really regret in my life was not being more appreciative of my grandmother but I don't feel guilty about it. So if I were looking at that myself and I, if I caught myself feeling guilty about it, I could do that out loud. Why do you feel guilty about not being more appreciative of my grandmother? Well, my answer is because I wish I had been. And if you wish you had been, why do you feel guilty now? By the way, my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> You right. Know? Yeah. All we I'm going to gonna do is be more appreciative now of yes. people who are who are kind and caring and loving and supportive, like you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a story or two that you like to tell of somebody that worked either with you or by themselves working on their beliefs and had some change, some noteworthy, you know, measurable, maybe even miraculous change? I do have one, but I might cry. <laughs> I had a neighbor in uh, Rosendale, New York, which is a small town upstate in Hudson Valley, on the poor side of the Hudson River. And um, I'm going to try to make it short because it went spanned years. And she had 12 children. She was a widow. She had six older kids and six younger kids. And seven or eight of them were still at home. And they were cold and they were hungry. I didn't know that at first. I just knew they were kind of raggedy kids. And they were sort of shunned by the neighborhood. And we had just moved in there, my son and I. <clears throat> and we got to know each other. Our kids would go off to school together on the school bus. And she didn't have a way to get groceries. She didn't drive. So I offered to take her to go grocery shopping when I went to the next town. But little by little, I got to know her. And after a couple of years, we were in the grocery store and she was buying a, a cereal with a lot of sugar in it. And I said, you know, Mary, that's kind of an awful lot of sugar in it. It might not be good for the kid's teeth because her kid's teeth were a horror story. And she said, oh, I didn't know. 
And then she said, I don't read so good. And then eventually she let me know she didn't know how to read. And I said, I bet you, I bet you we could learn how together. And she just kind of looked away. It was maybe a year till she asked, do you think we really could? And we did. Every day after the kids went up to school, we worked on reading. And if we had more time, I would tell you things like when she hit a block and she mm. couldn't move through it. And 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 we did. And I, by asking a question, I finally said, Mary, I don't think we can get any further unless you tell me how you feel. And I'd never seen this woman cry. I'd seen her go through really tough things. And she looked down and she said, I feel shamed. I feel mm. stupid and shamed. And Joe, I swear it was like time and space dissolved. Mm. And I could I could feel what it was like for her when she gave up, when it just got too hard. And I said, I bet you can remember when you gave up. And she said, I can. She talked like a mountain woman because she grew up in the in the Adirondacks. She said, I certainly can. And she said, but I'm not giving up now. And she read the whole page. Mm. She went on to buy a house, get her first job in her 50s, wound up being in charge of housekeeping at a large motel. And um, another belief that came from knowing her was one day she said to me, I tell my kids not no Gail Weller's never going to get no place in this world. <laughs> and I said, Mary, you, you might not want to say that she said why i said because it might not have to be true mm. she said oh i never thought of that well years later i went back to visit and i told her that sometimes i told her story to people i said but i never tell your name and she said oh you can tell them my name you where i go <laughs> you tell them my name's mary gail weller mm. That was just extraordinary, but the belief, as you see, it was her reality. It was her con her conception of her lot in life. You know, it's not, you know, I believe the sky is blue and, you know, I believe Robin's coming to spring. It's, it's deeper and more pervasive than that. And my two favorite things are with beliefs. Working with poor people to help them realize that's not an inevitable lot in life. And working with wealthy people who are unhappy <laughs> wow. and don't enjoy the abundance, you know, that they have accumulated or inherited, or I don't care how they get it, uh, but wealthy people who don't enjoy life. So I'm curious about a couple of things. There's so many things I can ask you in a limited amount of time. But one of them is, can we live without beliefs? I don't think so. Mm hmm so that would mean that there's beneficial. Merge. Well, I think we'd be enlightened. I think I have a hunch that that's where you go truly limitless. Yes. I think we, we glimpse it in moments in meditation and in your work with zero limits. There are moments when it all just disappears and fades mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. But we need something to na navigate life with through. Mm -hmm. And so there's beneficial beliefs and there's not so beneficial beliefs. At least that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it seems to me that it's often difficult to find the beliefs. If somebody is living in what they consider to be their personal universe, they don't think of it as their personal universe. They're just mm -hmm. living. They're getting up. They're going to work or not to work, depending on what's going on in the world. And they're, they're talking about the world. They're thinking about the world. They're judging the world, but they're not thinking about it as this is my mindset. This is my belief system causing me to think this and see this. How do we begin to awaken to some of the limiting beliefs. I know you gave us some tips there, but I'm kind of urging you and kind of pushing you a tiny bit into a corner to say, can you give us some more yeah. to help us see those limiting beliefs so that we can, we can break free. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought it up again because you're right. It's like a duck in the water or what, a fish in the water. Yes. Yes. The fish. <laughs> I, I live near a duck pond. <laughs> a fish in the water doesn't get going. Am I a fish? Am I in water? Um, but so 
it, it, it's those same two clues, but they're so pervasive. If you're just always, if you're feeling some way you don't like feeling, most mm. people just endure it or they try to change their circumstances so they don't have to feel that way anymore. Mm. You know, if, if someone is feeling uh, angry at work, what do people do? Um, they start thinking, I need to get a new job or shall I confront the boss or shall I do this? Shall I do that? It doesn't occur to us because we, we're not taught it to question, what am I angry about at mm. work? Why is angry the way to feel in this situation? I worked with a man who came to me as an executive sales marketing guy because of anger at work. And he thought what we were going to do was learn how to control his anger. And it turned out the person he was angriest with the most, he wound up crying because he wanted to help her and she was intractable. She was too stubborn. She wouldn't listen. She was too defensive. And he wound up crying that he couldn't help her. Mm. And yet he had thought he had a problem with anger at work. He found another job and he's very, very happy. But first we worked through the anger. So always question a feeling that you don't like having, a feeling that is troublesome. Um, and anytime you want something and you think, oh, yeah, but I can't have that or it would be too hard or uh, my kind of people just don't get those kind of things. Question mm -hmm. it. Why? What's true about it? If you question those two areas, I think you'll break out of the prison. Yes. I love it. And that's exciting. And this is why you're the breakout coach here. I went to your website earlier, which is MandyEvans.com for all the viewers. And I saw your article about the mightiest motivator, which I really, really enjoyed it because it, it illustrated how we motivate ourselves, whether it's the organic natural desire, and there might be another phrase for it, or the misery motivation that I think most of us do, but we don't label it that way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we're also, as we record this, or it's still at the beginning of a brand new year. And there are people that are looking at resolutions or intentions or goals or just surrendering and not doing any of it because it never worked before. How do they get to the point of deciding what they want and going for it? I think we kind of, always know what we want unless we block it some way mm. and um there's a coach michael neal who once said if you don't know what you want just sit in a chair for a while till you want something <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. actually pretty cool I like that. Really just go is. sit down <laughs> just sit down be quiet and eventually you'll be aware of wanting something right <laughs> The strongest motivation I have ever found is desire. Now that, like money, has a very bad reputation. You know, it's, it's, the quote is, uh, again, misquoted. The quote people say is, desire is the cause of all suffering. But the actual quote is, misunderstood desire is the cause of all suffering. And I think the misunderstanding is attachment. You know, when you get, when you get believing I can't be all right without it, which leads us into what you were saying. It's misery motivation. You know, it's believing it. You know, if I'm not angry about not having it, I won't reach for it. If I'm not upset about not having it, I won't reach for it. And I don't think any of that is true. Um, and if you really want an example, babies. Right. If you want to watch a baby learn how to walk, you will see an example of pure desire and the incredible power. I mean, mm. those little guys, they get up, they fall flat on their butt. What do they do? They don't sit there and go, I must not be doing it right. Oh, I haven't tried hard enough. Maybe mm. I should be doing it a different way. I doubt very seriously. They just want to stand up. They want to reach something they can't get from down there on the floor. So they do. They do it over and over and over. And then pretty soon, they're just walking. So with desire, just notice what you want, what you really want. I've worked with a lot of people who are upset that they can't make themselves get something they don't really want. Mm. Um, That's something you may have to repeat. Can you say that again? 
I've worked with a lot of people who've had a lot of trouble trying to make themselves get something they don't really want. What would be an example of that? Um, I worked with someone who kept coming up with ideas that she could sell on Amazon. And frankly, they didn't seem like really great ideas to me. Uh And she wasn't a salesperson. And she would have hated it, but she didn't like her life. So she thought she thought she would have to come up with some way to make a success so she could feel all, about, all right about her life. And in very few sessions, we untangled some of those snarls and she realized she was afraid to be happy in her life. Mm. She was afraid if she were happy the way her life was, she wouldn't reach for other things. Mm. And so little by little, and well, not little by little, very quickly in very few sessions, she um, became much happier at work at her present job, was getting along much better with her coworkers, was making more money, um, was redoing her home, really enjoyed that. Uh, got a pet, was very happy with her pet, and then just canceled um, a session because she was going off on a dream trip that she never dared (laughs) take. And the last time I talked to her, she said, I'm changing so much, but you know, it's all on the inside. Um, Wow. Do you feel that there's an organic desire list within us? I don't know if I'm saying that right, but instead of having an outside list that we feel we should be doing, there's an organic list. It's a little, a little bit like the baby. The baby doesn't have a list. Nobody's given it a list. And it's just saying, I want to walk. It's not even saying that it's just trying to walk and then walking. Is there, is there kind of like a GPS system inside of us in each of us? And I'm genuinely asking, I don't really know. I just want your take on it. I don't know for sure either, but I think the closest we have is desire. Mm. But it's one step at a time. And they can be like lightning, you know. It could go like into you know, the stratosphere, but it is one step at a time. And it frequently it starts with I want to feel better. Mm. And it always ends in I want to be happy. I don't care what anybody wants. I have done this exercise hundreds of times of you know, I want a new car. Why do you want a new car? So I can be, look successful. Why do you want to look successful? So people will respect me. Why do you want people to respect me? So I can be happy. I mean, it always ends there. So if you do what you really want to do, but people are so afraid to trust themselves to do what they want, you know, people, they get divorced and they leave town when all they need is a nap. But they're afraid. They're afraid to just relax and rest. Mm. Uh, that's a really strong example. Um, desire marks the path. I have twice. This is insane. But twice I've done a week long workshop on desire marks the path. And the first time I did it was in Iowa, in Fairfield, Iowa, and it sounded like a good idea when we came up with it. And then I realized. <laughs> what on earth am I going to do for a week on this topic? But it turned out to be fascinating. Um, I did it again in the Netherlands. And um, I'm remembering that things were so different. One person wanted to be a successful songwriter. Another person wound up who had, who had terminal cancer, wanting a peaceful death. Hmm. She was radiant when she realized that's what she wanted more Mm. than anything. Wow. Um, So it's individual, it's exquisite, but it's your GPS. And what else do you have to go by? What somebody else thinks you ought to do? What somebody else wants for you? Um, This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Now, I know from experience with you that you've taught the blue sky list. And the blue sky list might be worth narrating right now because again as i mentioned we're recording this it's still the new year is 2022 people are still looking at what do i do and how do i do it there's an alternative there's a there's a fun cool exercise could you explain that for a moment yes um 
it really opens up kind of a path to desire to just think about, well, if you could get it out of the clear blue sky yeah. without having to do anything to deserve it or anything to get it, what would you like to have just show up in your life? And, um, and then just write, don't be reasonable, just write freely. I was telling somebody I work with about a system I learned years ago for entrepreneurs and executives about where you, you keep a list of, um, of notes so you don't have to remember them. And then you have a to-do list and then you have a project list of things you're working on. And then you have a to-have list. And he was explaining this to his assistant. She said, I don't get the to-have list. He said, oh, that's what you want to have to show up. Ah. You know, just, you know, come up, just show up in your life. And she was totally baffled by that. But um, the blue sky does to let you be kind of aware of what would you like to move toward mm. or, or um, have come to you. Uh, and people are surprised at the things that they think of that, that are buried. Mm. So they, they make that... Go ahead. Okay. Then you can go through that list and if, if and look at them and think of any that you think you can't have that are doable. I mean, if I think I want to fly to the moon, you know, tonight, I I kind of can't get really strong behind that. Right. right. <laughs> I have a belief that it's not going to happen. But if it seems doable, like other people could have it, you know, look at those and why couldn't you have it? And you'll unearth the beliefs that might be blocking you, that might be stopping you from reaching for it. You know, if we just go through life reaching from one branch to the other of what we like, it may start with a nap. And then it may wind up with, well, I want to clean up the kitchen. And then it might be, I'm going to write that novel. Mm. You know, it, it goes like that. But if it mm-hmm. starts out with, I'm exhausted and my kitchen's a mess and I'm trying to make myself write a novel, it's hard. Right. So your list is much more fun. The way I remember that you first told it to me, and, and this is decades past, so I may be remembering incorrect, is not only did I write down the blue sky list, which means I just welcome it. It fell out of the sky, it showed up in my driveway, showed up in my lap. There it was. What, what would I welcome? And I make the list. And I don't worry about how. And as you mentioned, I'm not reasonable at all. I just put whatever that comes to mind, just put it there. And so there's no worry, there's no concern, there's no how, there's no strategy. It's just desire making the list. But what I remember is, I think you had said, put the list away and you can check it every now and then, like months later or a year later, because very often some of the list came true. I Yeah, I've done it in workshops and it's, it's in both of my books as a suggestion. Uh, and uh, for New Year's, instead of resolutions for years, I just write, I welcome. You know, wow. if I could get it out of the clear blue sky, what do I welcome into my life? And very often I'll go the next year and go, oh, wow, you know, I forgot all about that. But look, here it is. There's so many more things I want to ask you, Mandy. I want to uh, ask about the past. Let me do that real quick because we're running out of time, but I want to get all I can out of you and help as many people as I can in this moment we have together. What about the past? If there are people going, yeah, I want to change my life, but because this happened to me when I was five or 10 or my parents left me or I was adopted and I've been programmed in a certain way because of the adoption, I'm making up things. But Mm -hmm. if some, you know, somebody is sitting here, they're watching and they're going, yeah, I want to live the zero limits living lifestyle we're alluding to, but my past I'm stuck. What do they do? It is so important to come to terms with your past. Um, My book, uh, Traveling Free, How to Recover from the Past by Changing Your Beliefs, is based on a workshop I did. I only did it about five times. It was really tough. Um, But the question that seemed to bring up the most uh, in the workshops that I started the book with is, what was hard for you? Mm. What was hard about it? what did it mean to you and then do you believe that Um, because everybody says I don't want to live in the past of course not but we live by the past Mm. we live by 
all the assumptions we, we adopted, all the beliefs we adopted, and all the versions of reality that seem true. And during hard times, we adopt those beliefs and live by them without questioning them. Ah. And so what we can do now is question them. Yes. When we question them, do we in effect change the past or do we just change our version of the past? We change what it means to us, mm. which changes our relationship to it. There's mm -hmm. um, on, on my website, there's a, a free audio of a talk I did at the Betty Ford Center about my own past with a, a violent alcoholic father. And um, it's free. It's almost an hour long. And it's on my, my website. Which is MandyEvans.com. Yeah, and that, that goes in, into depth of kind of my own looking at my own past and, and some about working with other people. But I'm glad you brought that up because everybody has a past and everybody's been through very, very hard times. And in those, we often come to conclusions like, Ain't no Gale will are never going to get no place in this world that might not have to be true. Uh, well, speaking of that, you know, we're creating the past right now because we're <laughs> still in a pandemic. And this pandemic has lasted a couple of years. I, I lost track, two years or more. What are your suggestions for finding the opportunities and the abundance in a pandemic? What an interesting question, because, you know, some people have thrived. Yes. The people who, who I think, follow their desire and their imagination and their creativity mm. and didn't limit themselves. What a belief-busting breakout this pandemic has been, as hard as it's been and as, as tragic as some of the losses. But <clears throat> in everything, there are opportunities so I think the pandemic has given people great opportunity to look inside when, when everything that they knew the way life had to be crumbled away and changed, and they had to create a new way to get through. Some people, you know, did it with drugs or alcohol or, or ways that didn't work at all for them. But so many people... Uh, for instance, I, I became at peace with myself in a way I never thought possible. Oh. I, 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 you could probably put me in a, just a room with a couple of books and I'd be happy for the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing. It didn't stop me from wanting other things. In fact, it kind of intensified my desire to, to share with other people, to, to find ways to help people break out from the limits that they saw. This is so beautiful. You know, why are we afraid of happiness? I know that you talk about the happiness bonus. You had said at the end of all the questioning and the desire is happiness. Why, why do we seem to be afraid of it or deny it or just we're avoiding or at least avoiding stating the very thing that we actually want? I know, isn't that? Oh, I love it in a bad way. Right. Um, yeah, I think that is one that's taught over and over and over, you mm. know, that you shouldn't be happy, you should work hard, it, you know, in school, when kids are not rewarded for sitting around laughing in class, wouldn't that be wonderful, though, if, you know, you got A's for being the happiest kid in the class. Um, <laughs> it's making me laugh just to think about it. I like the idea. <laughs> and then the are awful beliefs about punishment, about the effectiveness of punishment. So mm. we learn to punish ourselves, through, you know, punish our way through our own lives, uh, you know, with guilt, with anger, with self-doubt, with regret, with remorse. Um, and that terrible fear that if we were happy, we wouldn't do anything. We would just sit there. And yet, if you look in your life, in mine and many other people, we make the greatest moves when we're happy. You know, mm. I worked with somebody once who got a divorce, as, as hard as that was for her. She thought it came from years of being unhappy. And I said, can you remember the day you decided to call the lawyer or tell your husband or make the move? And she said, yes, I was really happy. <laughs> I was feeling strong and confident. And I thought, Now's the time. Now, that motivation 
probably lasted, I don't know, two minutes. And it was strong enough for her to make a life-changing move. Mm. But because she had spent two, three years gearing up to it, that's what seemed like did it. You know, it seemed like that's what did it, feeling bad for three years, mm. you know, until I finally had enough. But the moment when you see another way is always quick. And that's what helps us make just giant steps in moves in a new direction. Mandy, I am so grateful for you, for this time, for knowing you, for all you have done for me. I, I want to say something that is unforgettably moving in articulating how grateful I am, and I'm at a loss to get there. So I'm hoping you feel it from me. And as we have a minute or two left, is there a real takeaway that you want people to have that maybe you didn't cover because I didn't ask it something they can do something they can think something they could act on. Of course, go to your website, MandyEvans.com. Of course, get your books. I don't know if you do coaching anymore and you can answer that. If so, it would be at your website. Um, what would be a takeaway? What would be a thought? What would be a quote? What would you like to say here? Well, you, you brought up, how, does, how do I feel hearing you say this? Well, I feel incredibly grateful to be blessed with your amazing generosity of spirit and information, uh, inspiration, information and inspiration. So I would encourage people to keep watching your show. Oh. To also, please go to my website. I've put everything on it except my books free and they're cheap. So it ranges from free to cheap. Um, <laughs> and then always, always question unhappiness and question any belief that tells you that you can't have what you really want in your heart of hearts, not what you think you ought to want, not what somebody else thinks you should want, but what you really want. Mm. Mandy Evans, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody, I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. This is Zero Limits Living. I appear every Friday bringing you inspiration and information to help you have a better life, a happier life. And you can watch the show on Roku, Amazon TV, Apple T Amazon Fire, Apple TV, <laughs> Roku, YouTube. And I put up a website that you can go and sign up for alerts whenever these things air on Fridays. Go to ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. Meanwhile, I'm grateful for all of you and expect miracles. Glutathione is a big word. It's the body's own master antioxidant. It's a scavenger for free radical, bacteria, and viruses. There are no products in the market with the ingredient NASET. NASET increases the production of glutathione that's in our body already to strengthen and enhance our immune system, elevate sense of well-being, support muscle strength and endurance, cognitive function, and liver support. It helps with increased energy and blood sugar regulation. Get your bottle of GSH Plus from www.salvationnutra.com.